We are live now. So, hello everyone. Uh, warm welcome to you all. My name is Rachit. I'm a company secretary by profession and I'm a part of Textman's research and advisory team. I'll be co-hosting today's webinar with uh, CS Osuna ma'am on the topic new overseas investment norms. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce our speaker, uh, CS Osuna ji, uh, who will talk to us on the new investment norms, uh, sharing with, our, with us her profound knowledge and experience on the subject. Uh, Sudha ma'am is a chartered accountant, company secretary, insolvency resolution professional, and um, a registered valuer. She is known as an expert in the domain. She has trained thousands of professionals in the field of Emma. She has written more than seven best-selling books and has been uh, and has more than two decades of experience in handling complex transactions uh, in the in the act. A warm welcome to you, ma'am. So before we start uh, uh, today's webinar. A small message for the participants, uh, your mic will be on mute uh, during the presentation. Uh, therefore, if you have any queries, you may write it down on the chat box. Uh, we would be uh, covering your queries at the end of session. So uh, today's webinar would cover the nuances of the amendment and the way forward, including discussions on uh, overview of major changes brought in by the new norms, rule-wise impact, uh, impact on uh, existing investments, way forward for the investment uh, by individual and businesses. Uh, at last, we'll be discussing reporting requirements and uh, they'll be followed by the Q&A session. So the regulatory framework for overseas investment in India has undergone a overhaul with the introduction of FEMA overseas investment rules to 2020, 2022 and uh, FEMA overseas investment regulations 2022, superseding the erstwhile regulations. Under the old regulations, overseas investment was considered to be investment in joint venture or investment in polio subsidiary, which created some sort of confusion in relation to overseas investment by various persons in other entities. Further, overseas investment by individual, investment by way of loan, debt, securities, round tripping concept were also topics of discussion under the old regulations. Now, in order to make investment regulations simpler and to provide certain clarifications, relaxations, Government of India has made changes to overseas investment regulations and rules thereunder. The new regime, which has uh, already effective from 22nd August, combines the erstwhile FEMA transfer of security, transfer of issue of foreign security regulations 2004 and FEMA acquisition and transfer of immovable property outside India regulations 2015. It has also brought in certain new provisions which are thought-provoking as well as debatable. So let's start with an overview of the changes brought in by the new investment norms. The first and foremost question that comes to one's mind as why there are separate rules regulations uh, separately issued by the central government and RBI. The answer to this lies back to the enforcement of uh, amendment proposed in the Finance Act 2015 in October 2019, whereby the power vested with the central government and RBI with respect to permissible capital transaction were re-examined. And accordingly, the power to frame rules related to non-debt instruments were vested with central government and to frame regulations relating to debt instrument were vested with RBI. The second question is, what does this uh, overseas investment rules provides? The entire framework for the overseas investment rules provides uh, framework for making overseas investment, uh, which are covers the permissions required for uh, making uh, overseas investment, conditions for making overseas in investments, restrictions uh, from making ODI. It prescribes pricing guidelines, transfers, liquidation, and restructuring of ODI. While the overseas investment rules have been framed by the central government, however, the same will be administered by the RME as per Rule 3. OI regulation, on the other hand, provides operational part covering conditions for undertaking financial commitment, mode of payment, obligation of person resident in India, reporting requirements, consequences of delay in reporting, and restrictions on further uh, fund commitments and uh, transfers, financial commitment and transfers. Some of the new concepts have been used uh, in the uh, overseas investment, for example, the term foreign entity. Under the extent, uh, uh, earlier there was a concept of joint venture and wholly owned subsidiary. 
which is now been substituted and a new regime with the concept of foreign entity which means an entity formed or registered or incorporated outside india including ifscs and that has limited liability the so the term limited liability would be a structure such as limited liability company llp where the liability of the person resident in india is clear and limited uh other concept uh, other term has been uh, defined that is indian entity so earlier there was a concept of indian party where all investors from india in a foreign entity were together considered as ip that is indian party which has now been substituted under the new regime that is the concept of indian entity where investor entity shall be separately considered as an indian entity the indian entity shall mean company a body corporate a llp or a partnership firms further the the term overseas portfolio investment has been clearly defined which has removed the ambiguities earlier the term the over, port, overseas portfolio investment was not defined in the regulations which brought a lot of confusions with regard to compliance and categorization of investments now the same has been defined as the new norms opi means investment other than odi in foreign securities but not in unlisted debt instrument or any securities which uh, issued by person is in india who is not in ifsc also the term odi has been clearly revamped as per the new norms the term odi means an investment by way of acquisition of unlisted equity capital of a foreign entity or subscription as a part of memorandum of association of foreign company foreign entity or uh, this is uh, through in case of unlisted company so in case of listed company investment in 10% or more of the paid up capital paid up equity capital of a listed foreign entity or investment with control where investment is less than 10% of the paid up capital will also be deemed as odi now a new concept has been introduced like uh, recognition of uh, payment on deferred basis as per new norms payment for consideration for capital acquired can be deferred for definite period of time for for that uh, the there has to be a twin condition has to be followed first the seller the seller uh, must transfer to the uh, buyer the foreign securities equal to amount of total consideration and the consideration which is uh, finally paid shall be compliant with the applicable pricing guidelines there have been further relaxation relaxations with regard to timelines for repatriation of dues uh, uh, the reporting uh, of the apr annual performance report has been rationalized uh, the provision uh, regarding uh, late submission fees has been uh, described in the regulations this investment has been clearly defined earlier this was not uh, there the disinvestment norms has been uh, rationalized now Uh, the rbi's approval in case of disinvestment with right of has been done away with similarly entities under investigation are allowed to make odi uh, np account holders uh, willful defaulters uh, defaulters are required to take uh, nocs from the lender bank uh, and further the arm length pricing has to be followed for the issue transfer of foreign en uh, entity equity in in place of fair uh, value now uh, i have covered a, a introduction part now i would request uh, ma'am to take this all from here and uh, share her profound knowledge on the subject with us uh, thank you rachit it was a nice brief introduction and uh, i would like to welcome everyone to uh, this uh, webinar on the overseas uh, new regime with regard to the uh, is my screen shared yes ma'am it is visible okay okay you are able to see the ppt right yes okay great great uh, so we were saying that uh, welcome to the webinar and uh, there uh, i can see the number of participants almost exceeding 100 and uh, with the happy to such uh, see such an interest in the in this subject 
and uh, so we have all assembled here we have all uh, gathered for this webinar to understand what exactly are the new odi rules regulation directions are uh, which we will be referring together as new odi uh, investment regime to start with do you know uh, that as per the latest available rbi data uh, that is not too old that is from uh, Uh, published in august 2022 and that pertains to the figures in july or uh, from july 2020 uh, 2022 there are more than 100 entities which have made investment outside india in the month of july and the amount that has been remitted outside india comes around 1100 million usd so no wonder that we are talking here about uh, the odi investment regime and the government has taken the step to rationalize it further it is not only uh, the big companies uh, but also the mid size small entities which are now exploring the global markets overseas investment as such enhances scale and scope of business operations uh, by providing global opportunities for growth and diversifying the risk increasing the competitiveness of indian entities and obviously boosting their brand value through easier access to technology research and development wider global market and reduced cost of capital and these overseas investments are very important drivers of foreign trade and technology transfer as well uh, which boost domestic employment investment growth and such interlinkages so the government definitely um, it makes sense for them to liberalize and rationalize the odi regime and to promote the ease of doing business if if we so what how we are going to uh, take through this webinar uh, that 50 minutes that we have we we'll talk about little bit about uh, the introduction then we we'll talk about the rules regulations and directions then we we'll talk about the major changes uh, which has come through these rules and regulations and then we we'll try to cover rule wise uh, description and uh, we we'll try to discuss the changes which has come from the old regime to the uh, new regime when we talk about the odi when we talk about the odi basically what do we talk when we talk about odi we are talking about who can make investment how the investment can be made how much investment can be made what is the manner of investment and whether government approval is required whether whether rbi approval is required what are the obligations of indian party and when the investment is made how easy or onerous or how what is the process with regard to the disinvestment or restructuring and how what are the various uh, ways the manner i mean at the price at which such an investment can be made so basically this is what we talk about when we say or talk about the odi investment and those people who are savvy with the a previous regime they will be able to understand that there are there is complete over shuffling of the over uh, of the uh, odi norms of the of, uh, from the older uh, version of it but i was saying that it is not that the old regime as such was not uh, rationalized to our experience of assisting the businesses houses and companies resi uh, residents apart from the few ambiguities the way investment can be made outside india was a settled law only uh, but yes there were lot of open issues the com wonders compliances and approvals in old regime as a matter of fact the central government and the reserve bank of india have been progressively simplifying the procedure and compliances and rationalizing the rules and regulation under fema at all the places be it fdi be it ecb be it lobo po we have been seeing a complete rationalization at all over places and complete a uh, confidence of rbi put in the uh, the working of ad banks and the 
other stakeholder and we are certainly testimony uh, to that fact let us see what we have in the old uh, new regime and what we had in the uh, old regime so the ast while it was uh, managed the odi investment was regulated by foreign exchange management uh, just uh, i'm sorry i should have said it in beginning any questions uh, since there are lot of participants so uh, this webinar uh, is on the chat mode only i would request that you keep on posing your questions uh, from starting so that we can take it up uh, at the end of the session so presently uh, till 21st of august 2022 a uh, the odi investment was regulated by foreign exchange management transfer or issue of foreign security regulations 2004 read with master direction on the direct investment outside india so we all know that by finance act uh, 2015 the power of rbi to uh, make regulations to regulate the non debt instrument had been shifted to the central government now keeping in consideration the same in 2019 if you remember and if you have dealt with it the central government had come with fema ndi rules that it fema non debt instrument rules 2019 which pertains to the foreign investment in india in the same lines now the central government in consultation with the rbi had put in place the draft foreign exchange management overseas rules and regulations for public consultation now after that consultation after one year or approximately one year of it the government has come up along with the central government has come up with the new rules regulations and master direction i mean it's a it's a symphony of the rules regulation and uh, direction that we can see uh looking into the fact that central government and rbi they used to be so much of delay to get in sync now with fdi norms also and now in this odi we are seeing that all the regulations which are given by the rbi the rules which are given by uh, the uh, central government and directions which are given by rbi are have come on the same day the erstwhile overseas investment by person resident in india were governed uh, by uh, foreign exchange management 2004 we have seen that and now along with the acquisition and transfer of immovable property outside india regulation 2015 it has been subsumed in foreign exchange management overseas rules overseas investment rules and regulation 2022 the revised regulatory framework for overseas investment it provides for simplification of existing framework for the investment and has been aligned with the current uh, business and economic dynamics of the uh, company so we have uh, seen what exactly the uh, these rules and regulations so rules are made in the manner of ndi rules only and it is governed by the schedules there are 21 rules 12 regulation and the master direction uh, so for undertaking any transaction all three needs to be seen together just briefly touching on what are the rules regulations and direction i'm sure everyone is savvy to that however uh, let me briefly uh, touch on it for the people uh, for the clarification now oi rules provides Uh, first there is there is a rule that provides for the overall regulatory framework for how the foreign investment uh, will be made what are the permission required uh, conditions for making overseas investment restrictions for making overseas investment uh, pricing guidelines transfer liquidation restructuring so basically rules gives the total uh, skeleton and the overall framework on how the overseas investment can be made now under rules rule 3 talks about that the power to administer the rule has been given to uh, reserve bank of india now reserve bank of india will make the regulation so reserve bank of india 
drawing the power from rule three of OI rules is has made OI regulations, which provides only the operational part of the rules, uh, which covers conditions for undertaking financial commitment, investment in uh, debt, uh, debt in secure, uh, secure debt instruments, and uh, consideration in case of uh, how the consideration can be paid, whether deferred consideration can be paid, mode of payment, obligation of a person who has made investment outside India, reporting uh, requirements, et cetera. To further clarify on the regulations and rules, the Reserve Bank is empowered to issue such directions and circular instructions. And uh, taking pursuant to that power, Reserve Bank has issued the power uh, to the, uh, has issued foreign management overseas directions to 2022. Uh, now, further to these three rules, regulation, and directions, uh, there are new forms also issued pursuant to the uh, updation of master direction, uh, pursuant to which ma master direction on reporting has been updated. Now, there used to be form FD ODI. That form ODI has been replaced with form FC and also form FPI to report the foreign portfolio uh, Overseas or, uh, or portfolio investment has been uh, introduced. So this is about the regulation. Now, before to before we diverge into details about the new overseas investment regime, let us see what happens to the existing investment. There is a grandfathering provision with regard to the uh, investment outside India, which are made under erstwhile regulations. Now, any investment or financial commitment, which had been made in accordance with the act or the erstwhile regulations shall be deemed to have been made under these uh, rules and regulations. So this there is a uh, uh, grandfathering provision that has been given. There are, there were a lot, as I said, there was not too many discrepancies or uh, open issues with regard to the investment outside India. However, there were a lot of issues in the old regime, which caused India, which the Indian companies were facing, Indian residents were facing, AD bankers were facing, because there was no clarity in the uh, old regime. Now, there are three things that have been done by the new regulation, that is rationalization, liberalization, and uh, bringing clarity. Uh, rationalization to the extent that uh, there are a lot of provisions which are rationalizing in nature to the uh, extent that uh, deferred consideration is allowed and uh, disinvestment without uh, write off has been allowed. Liberalization by way that the Indian company, which is not engaged in financial services activity, can also engage in the financial service activity except banking or uh, insurance. Now, at lot many cases, especially the understanding with regard to the portfolio investment, erstwhile, I'll say erstwhile portfolio investment uh, by Indian entities and resident individuals. In new rules, they have defined OPI, which brings a lot of uh, relief, puts end to confusion and uh, ambiguity. So we'll be uh, uh, seeing how uh, that OPI is defined and uh, uh, what is the uh, provisions with regard to that? Overall, uh, there are 21 uh, rules uh, covering uh, the various aspects of uh, the overseas direct investment. Uh, I, uh, if it, uh, I said already that uh, this ODI rules looks like the way they, they have formed, they have framed the FDI rules because uh, the how the ODI can be done, how OPI can be done, how uh, overseas investment by a resident individual can be done. So these have been the the details of it are in the not in the rule but in the schedules. So there are specific schedules. There are uh, schedules with regard to the various investment uh, and uh, the details of how the uh, investments uh, by different type of uh, entities is being given in that. Uh, Schedules. There are 12 uh, regulations and uh, which these. So the significant 
changes that has been made as already uh, been discussed by as had been highlighted by rachit a uh, definition of opi has been introduced there is enhanced clarity with regard to various definition introduction of the concept of strategic sector deferred consideration allowed uh, and uh, there is arm length price introduced so there are lot many uh, changes that has happened like uh, liberalization in uh, odi fdi structure noc and let us see them in detail new uh, definition introduced there are lot of uh, new definitions that has been introduced now the uh, control was not defined it is defined now this investment was not defined uh, we face so many so much of problem while dealing with the cases of this investment because it was not defined we took the uh, we took resort to the understanding wherever it was possible so so now to put end to all the confusions this investment has been defined equity capital has been defined financial regulator has been defined foreign entity ifsc legal entity uh, has been defined and uh, if you see the concept the uh, concept of foreign entity earlier there was a concept of jv and wholly owned subsidiary now that is been substituted by the uh, foreign entity which particularly means an entity formed or registered or incorporated outside india including the ifsc and one specific thing that they say that that has limited liability now limited liability as such will mean the structure where the liability of a person is clear and uh, limited so that's how they have defined uh, we'll be dealing with them in detail Uh, as and when they one thing one other definition we may see is strategic sector has been defined uh, for the first time and another uh, the importance of strategic sector that the restrictions that that is there with regard to the limited liability structure of foreign entity is not mandatory for entities with core with which have a core activity in any strategic sector. so if an entity wants to uh, do not want to have a limited liability they want to an indian entity want to bid in any uh, strategic sector they want to incorporate it is uh, not required that they should incorporate by way of limited liability only they can they can explore the unincorporated entities as well uh, for mainly it will uh, it will come in place come in use with regard to uh, the biddings that is to be take that uh, the entities take and for that they will not need now to have a uh, incorporation in the foreign land host country some of the definitions are clarificatory in nature some gives uh, uh, expands the uh, asked why definitions which were there now coming to the one of the major change i think the most significant change that we have is that the uh, new regime defines the opi that is op uh, that is overseas portfolio investment as anyone who has dealt in uh, the overseas investment will know that the overseas investment was uh, was defined to mean the direct investment it was defined to mean uh, the uh, with the concept of direct investment which meant that financial commitment by few ways and which does not include portfolio investment now such a definition of portfolio investment was not defined it was creating so much of issue that how if if i if a resident individual it although there was a uh, guidelines which every ad was uh, following and there was internal guidelines policies that when an investment will be considered as portfolio investment and when an investment uh, is considered as uh, the uh, finance uh, the direct investment however because of not availability of the definition that was there it created lot of uh, confusion and uh, whether the investment 
what it says that the portfolio investment up to 50 the the earlier asked while regulations it said that the only thing which it talked about portfolio investment was one that direct investment does not include portfolio investment and the second thing that was said was that portfolio invest uh, a listed indian company can make portfolio investment up to 50 percent of its net worth so these were the only two things that was said about the portfolio investment and apart from that everything else was left to the uh, interpretation uh, by the various stakeholders so now in this new oi regime they have defined opi they have defined overseas investment overseas investment the way it is defined is financial commitment and overseas portfolio investment now financial commitment you must be thinking that it should be odi here that overseas direct investment however financial commitment is a broad the way it is defined in odi regime now is a broader term than uh, the direct investment financial commitment includes odi plus debt plus the uh, non fund based commitments given by the indian entity to the foreign on behalf of the foreign entity so far we we'll, let us see what is odi as is defined in the uh, regulations so the odi the way it is defined means the uh, acquisition of odi means investment by way of acquisition of unlisted equity capital of the foreign entity unlisted equity capital if i want to take you just very quickly on the definition of equity capital it includes yeah it includes equity capital equity shares or perpetual capital or instrument that are irredeemable or contribution to non debt capital of foreign entity in the nature of fully and compulsorily convertible uh, instrument uh, if you see they want to include in equity capital it is all the type of compulsory and convertible uh, instruments are also included so any capital any investment in the unlisted entity shall be considered as odi so it is a replica of the way fdi uh, ndi rules are framed that all the investment in enlisted company will be considered as fdi and over and above 10% it will be considered as fdi enlisted entity so in the similar manner odi uh, in case of unlisted entity all the capital even if 0.5% of investment in unlisted uh, entity shall be considered as odi odi means investment by way of subscription as part of memorandum and uh, association of foreign entity that was there in the earlier direct investment outside india definition as well now uh, the change that has happened investment in 10% or more paid up capital of listed foreign entity so if the investment till 10% it will be Uh, it may be construed as opi depending on the nature however if the investment is more than 10% in that in listed entity it will be taken as the odi important thing which has been brought in the definition of odi is investment with con- if i can draw your attention here investment with control where investment is less than 10% of the paid up capital paid up equity capital of a listed entity in that case also the investment shall be construed as the in that case also the investment shall be taken as the odi investment now if you see 10% if you are holding more than 10% in that case it's odi only even if if it is less than 10% and the for indian entity is having control less than 10% with control in listed entity it will be constituted as the uh, overseas direct investment only the way uh, uh, control has been defined the definition of control 
has been inserted in ODI regime for the first time, and uh, it provides for exercise of control not only by not only by one way in any way, be it by appointment of majority of directors, by management or policy decisions, or by having the management right, shareholders right, by whatever manner the Indian entity is exercising the control over the foreign entity, it will be construed as the control. The major thing here is that the control, control is essential and uh, by whatever way it is acquired or it is, uh, uh, it is by whatever way control is uh, uh, exercised by the uh, Indian entity. So we see that there are five modes of exercising such control. However, the fact of exercising control uh, should be evident from the right to appoint majority of directors or control management or policy decision. So similar definition, except for 10% of voting uh, right threshold is provided under a Companies Act as well. And this concept of control is also relevant. We will, as we go forward, we'll see is also uh, uh, for the purpose of debt instrument, uh, while we are uh, seeing the step down subsidiary or to provide a guarantee uh, further. We have in the in the FDI, we have once FDI, once FDI, always FDI. Now what happens to the ODI, where the in, where in investment by the person resident in India in equity capital initially is classified as ODI. However, the investment falls below 10% later on. Now, in this scenario, if what happens if the investment later on falls below 10%? So, once ODI, always ODI, even if it falls below the 10% threshold, it will be construed as ODI. OPI, how OPI is defined? OPI is defined to mean any investment other than ODI in foreign security, but not in any unlisted uh, debt instrument or any security issued by the uh, by a person resident in India who is not in uh, an FC, uh, IFSC. So what does it mean that any other uh, investment other than ODI means less than 10%? And the, any investment in unlisted entity by way of OPI is not allowed. It can only be, OPI can only be done in the listed entities. The way foreign securities is defined in the act, it defines, uh, and, but OPI, but not in any unlisted debt instruments, uh, the instrument can be listed and uh, instrument which is redeemable or preferentially, uh, preferentially non-convertible or optionally convertible is also included in the uh, definition of, uh, not included in def definition of de debt instrument as such, but however, specifically provided in the direction. Also, OPI uh, uh, means any investment or in any security issued by a person resident in India who is not in an IFS. OPI by a person resident in India in the equity capital of listed entity, even after its delisting shall remain to be OPI only. So once an OPI, always an OPI. If you want to uh, see, it under, uh, see it again, how this whole thing is, so investment outside India in case of list, in case of unlisted entity, it will always be ODI. In case of, uh, in case it is made in, an unlisted entity, it will always be ODI. In case of listed entity, there can be three scenarios. One, it is less than 10% without control. In that case, it will be considered as OPI. Less than 10%, however, with control. In that scenario, it will be considered as ODI investment. Investment more than 10% will be considered as ODI only. We have already seen that uh, overseas investment now includes 
overseas uh, includes overseas portfolio investment and financial commitment so how overseas uh, investment is defined it is defined to include uh, the financial commitment and overseas portfolio investment we have seen we have already seen about the overseas investment and overseas portfolio investment now let us see what financial commitment as always the financial commitment was the investment which is allowed the manner in which is allowed by the indian entity to be made outside india the way it is defined is that the aggregate amount of investment made by a person resident in india by way of odi overseas direct investment by way of debt other than opi also it will include the non fund based facility which are extended uh, by uh, such other person or uh, yeah so if uh, the financial commitment as a definition i don't think that there is any change much change with regard to the understanding of the de definition definitely there is a change in wordings uh, the way the financial commitment is defined now however uh, the 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 components of financial commitment which were there that is odi debt and your non uh, fund based facilities in terms of guarantee pledging of uh, the uh, shares pledging of your asset remains the same with regard to the limit uh, the limit that was there uh, previously that how much so uh, when we talk about odi we talk about how much can be invested how it can be invested in what manner it can be invested so how much can be invested is is limit of financial commitment is restored so that is like 400% of the net worth net worth of the entity as on the date of as on the date of last audited balance sheet so if you see in all uh, foreign entities Four hundred percent has been kept same. A net worth which was not defined earlier has been defined now, and last audited balance sheet has been defined. So a lot of clarity in terms of last audited balance sheet. Uh, in terms of that, the balance sheet cannot be delayed. Cannot be uh, of the date preceding. the date of transaction which exceeds by 18 months so last audited balance sheet cannot be as on uh, uh, cannot be older than the period of mis audited balance sheet as on the date not exceeding 18 months preceding the date of transaction so if a uh, audited balance sheet not older than 18 months can be used Uh, similarly net worth was uh, not defined it has been defined now and uh, it has been made in sync with the definition as per the uh, companies act and uh, the definition has been widened and not only that that the new net worth has been defined uh, for the and uh, companies it has also been defined for the llps now calculation of uh, foreign uh, calculation of uh, financial commitment there is a change there is a lot of change with regard to uh, the uh, the way the calculation of financial commitment used to be in the erstwhile odi regulation so in the erstwhile odi regulation there were uh, certain uh, 400% the way we used to calculate 400% i used to come that there were certain exemptions that this particular amount which is lying in the efc account or which is lying in the by way of the utilization of the amount raised by uh, adr and gdr uh, will not be used for the calculation of 400% however now uh, the calculation of of uh, financial commitment only exclusion which is there is with regard to the capitalization of retained earning so if you have capitalized your retained earning those uh, 
those figures will not that those amount will not be included in your financial capital otherwise all of the things which were the uh, uh, financial commitment so uh, otherwise all other uh, limits which were erstwhile excluded from the calculation of financial commitment has now been included one of the significant change that has happened in terms of calculation of financial commitment earlier so the, the earlier the network of subsidiary and holding company could be clubbed together to make in uh, club together with an indian entity to make investment outside india however the concept of utilizing a network of subsidiary and holding by the indian company has now been discontinued more more so ever if the uh, so it has been discontinued for the purpose of the equity capital and debt however for the purpose of non fund based uh, guarantee the the commitment can be given by the group for uh, however when the commitment is given by the group in that that particular amount with regard to the exposure will be deducted from the net worth of such group company for the purpose of calculation of uh, financial commitment so the uh, the limits of financial commitment has been squeezed we just saw that odi investment can be uh, made to the uh, the financial commitment can be to the extent of 400% of the uh, net worth of the entity similar to this the limits for investment with regard to the opi investment has also been introduced now opi investment the limit is 450% uh, of the net worth as on the last audited balance sheet and uh, in case of a listed entity it can invest in any manner and uh, it also can invest by way of reinvestments so reinvestment is uh, permissible in case of listed entity how however in case of unlisted entity the opi investment can be made by way of right issue can be made by way of capitalization swap of shares merger or demerger only now if you see here that unlisted entity can make uh, the opi investment by way of right issue capitalization swap of securities merger and demerger how will Uh, how will the right issue or bonus share will arise? How will arise to the uh, Indian entity making the OPI investment? Because as such, any investment made in an unlisted entity is an ODI. However, an unlisted entity. I'm so sorry. There is a so unlisted entity by way of capitalization swap of shares and merger and demerger only they will uh, get the right and bonus issue there is no other way in which the opi investment can be done by the unlisted entity so earlier even this much clarity uh, was not there which has been brought in uh, by the new regime another significant change that has come is uh, with regard to the odi and fdi uh, structure so rbi in its faqs particularly odi that odi and fdi structure is not permitted was never prohibited in the regulation it is only in the faq of the erstwhile odi regulation which prohibited an indian party to set up indian subsidiary through its foreign boss or gb and it also prohibited an indian party to acquire a boss or investment in gb that already had direct investment or indirect investment in india so the structure which is seen here was not possible uh, till now in the present regime the structure has been made uh, possible however it is caveated uh, to the fact that it cannot be uh, with the more than two layers of subsidiary there are a lot of confusion with regard to 
uh, how the subsidiary uh, will be uh, will be seen from which level the subsidiary will be seen there is no confusion as such uh, because uh, the direction in uh, specifically defines that the subsidiary will be the and will be an entity on which the foreign entity has control and which includes a stake of 10% or more in an entity as per the oi rules however if that was to be the case it will create a lot of implementation issues and it will liberate and uh, the present odi mbi structure to a very large extent the uh, another uh, clarification that has uh, uh, liberalization i will say that has come is deferred consideration has been allowed deferred consideration was uh, not allowed till uh, now and uh, so in this uh, now the deferred consideration has been allowed and it is said that the deferred consideration will be treated as a non fund based financial commitment and shall be reported accordingly subsequent payment towards deferred consideration will be reported in the fc form fc as conversion of non fund based financial commitment to equity there is a valuation requirement which shall be done upfront in accordance with the pricing guidelines uh, wherever it is applicable this investment without approval uh, this is a very important change earlier this investment was subjected to too many conditions one and in most of the cases the rbi approval was required so it used to say the aswal regulation uh, in aswal regulation indian party which has now been replaced with indian entity it could invest without prior approval of rbi where the amount repatriated after disinvestment was less than the original amount invested subject to certain conditions and where the conditions were not met the uh, prior approval of rbi has uh, was required now these conditions of uh, this condition of prior approval of rbi has been done away with and the disinvestment can be done by following the terms conditions pricing guidelines as specified in the uh, rules so this was so overall changes this was the major changes uh, that has been brought in the new odi regime i will just see uh, the questions if there are any uh, questions we'll just take yeah so there is a question that uh, regarding round tripping allowing two layers of investment into india how layers will be counted whether two subsidiaries outside india is allowed under a foreign entity or it is it to be uh, counted under the indian entity so if you see the directions it specifically says that the subsidiary shall have meaning as provided in oi rules and entity in which foreign entity has control an entity in which foreign entity has control it does not say anything beyond that so if the interpretation was to be in that case any subsidiary will be counted and not necessarily that the subsidiary has to be in india is a lrs investment considered in calculation of 10% yes which regulation cover transfer of equity share of foreign company between two resident indians so it will be covered uh, by these regulation only there is um, in any in case of ecb by fco parent company and ico subsidiary of foreign company can indian subsidiary company render service on behalf of foreign company so this is not with pertaining to ecb
so uh, uh, if you see uh, we just discussed that the pricing guidelines here so when we are talking about the pricing guidelines the pricing has to be determined or done upfront so at the time when the investment is made the pricing has to be determined at that time so it has to be done upfront so it will not keep on fluctuating any more questions uh, we can take these or we'll move to the uh, regulation wise discussion of the regulation wise discussion <clears throat> okay there are questions in the i'll just see <clears throat> definitely definitely i agree that the round tripping needs further clarification and uh, uh, there are there is need for faqs to be issued by uh, the central government and rbi uh, to clear uh, clear uh, the issues which are now open in the new odi regime uh, for example the uh, pricing guidelines and uh, odi fdi structure definitely yes can an indian company invest in immovable property outside india without having uh, overseas office the investment by the uh, we'll take it out we will as a strategic sector okay strategic sector we had seen so strategic sector so someone is asking please elaborate so i'm just reading out the question we'll take them one by one uh, strategic sector and uh, meaning of non fund facilities for the purpose of financial commitment the non fund facilities as such has not been defined uh, ankita uh, however as the uh, as from the we can take the understanding from regulation because regulation 3456 uh, oi regulation 3456 particularly deals with financial commitment and now financial commitment uh, with regard to non fund uh, facility will include guarantee uh, will include the pledging of the asset indian asset i said outside india pledging of uh, shares of promoters pledging of shares of the uh, indian entity pledging of shares of the overseas entity and uh, like that a resident individual anshika is asking uh, a resident individual could transfer foreign securities in unlisted entity to a resident individual in inr in old regime see any transfer with regard to foreign assets in inr in any case will not be permissible so anshika that was not allowed in old regime and uh, it is not allowed now also any transfer wherein you are paying for the foreign assets in inr that is not allowed the another question in case of startup certificate from the host country is mandatory no there is no uh, question uh, there is no clarity on that wasavi that uh, uh, and the question is that whether the startup is defined in the host country as such so the startup certificate uh, if the we know that startup uh, ecosystem is there in almost all the countries however if it is like india wherein we need to have a certificate so as such there is no clarity on that and we may get some clarity in the faq to be issued by rbi and uh, central government is strategic sector allowed a resident individual and can foreign entity be owned by 100% by resident individual for this sector uh, meena can you please elaborate on your answer once again yeah, on your question odi compliances in case of individual investors in unlisted companies so odi compliances uh, this is an anonymous attendee 
ODI compliances in case of individual investor in unlimited uh, unlisted entity uh, will be see will uh, we just saw that all the reportings that used to be there has been changed. Now there is form FC which needs to be filed and a UIN needs to be generated by the AD banks and then there are other compliances uh, like uh, compliances as well as obligations uh, that are required like uh, form APR to be filed, the proof of uh, investment needs to be ascertained, uh, needs to be received in India within uh, 60 days of uh, the investment and uh, like that. So we we'll take, there are few more questions, we'll take them and then we'll proceed further. Yeah, so uh, now coming to the rule wise discussion, rule one as in all the cases defines the name of the uh, rule and talks about uh, the date of coming into force, which is 22nd of August, August 2022, uh, rule three talks about RBI. We have already discussed that, that the rules will be administered by the RBI. Rule four is more of a uh, clarification. I won't say clarificatory. It was always there in the old regime as well. It has just been uh, placed in, it has, it has been replaced into uh, the new regime also uh, as well wherein there the rules shall not apply to uh, in certain cases like any investment made outside india by by a financial institution in an ifsc or where overseas investment is made of uh, out of rfc account we know that rfc account in any case is a fund uh, which has been earned out from outside india so it has uh, this been exempted and uh, also uh, if a person has acquired any uh, security, removal property uh, when he was resident outside India. So those, uh, he can still hold those and these rules shall not apply uh, to uh, in such cases. Rule five basically talks about the uh, debt instrument and defines the non-debt instrument. So the distinction between debt and non-debt instrument as provided in rule five is relevant uh, as o, the overseas investment regulation provide for conditions that are to be complied by Indian entity while investing in debt instrument. So uh, regulation four specifically talks about the investment in uh, the debt instrument and the component of non-debt instrument, if you see, are same as defined under FEMA NDI rules 2019. So the debt instrument means government bonds, corporate bonds, all tranches of securitization structure, uh, which are not equity uh, tranche borrowing by uh, firms through loans and depository uh, receipts, whose underlying securities are debt instruments. With regard to the investment in debt instrument, there are conditions which are very new and which were not there in the old regime, like there has to be an uh, agreement, the price, that is uh, the, uh, the interest charge has to be on an arm's length basis. And the entity should have, the Indian entity should have control in the foreign entity in which the debt instrument, the investment in debt instrument has been made. Right issue and uh, bonus issue is just uh, clarificatory in nature. And it provides that a person who is a resident in India and who has acquired uh, and, and continues to acquire to uh, hold equity capital in the foreign entity in accordance with the rules may acquire the equity capital by way of uh, right issue as well as bonus issue. Main thing is about reporting. Right issue will be reported, uh, right uh, acquisition of shares by right issue will be reported in form FC. However, renunciation of rights in favor of person resident in India. Uh, so, uh, Ashita, if I can answer your, if you, if this is not exactly related to your question, uh, but somehow related because it's a renunciation of rights. 
uh, if it is in favor of resident in India, there is no reporting. If the, the renunciation of right is in uh, favor of uh, the renun uh, favor of person resident outside India, there is no reporting requirement. And in case of bonus shares also, there is no reporting requirement. So we will uh, now uh, prohibition on investment outside India. There is a prohibition on investment until unless the rules and regulations are followed. Rule nine talks about the overseas investment and it says and puts the condition that the a foreign entity has to be engaged in bona fide business activity only. So this was the condition before as well. However, the term bona fide business activity has not been defined. Now the term has been defined to mean any business activity which is permissible under any law in force in India and the host country or host jurisdiction as the case may be. Earlier, the investment by the entities which are under investigation or the entities which are willful defaulter or in the RBI's caution list was not allowed to be made. In the new rules, a non-performing asset, a willful defaulter entity under investigation can make investments subject to no objection certificate from the lender bank or uh, the investigating authority as the case may be. So this is the uh, welcome change that has come. So uh, if we want to understand this, we can uh, see that the central government approval is required if the foreign entity is in Pakistan. Uh, the FDR, F, uh, the financial commitment is more than the limit prescribed by the person engaged in strategic sectors. RBI approval is required if the financial commitment exceeds the ceiling prescribed in a consultation with the central government. And the NOC from lender is uh, and respective agencies is required in the respective cases. Coming to rule 11 to 15, as I mentioned, that the new OI rules provides for schedules in the same manner as provided in the NDI rules, which makes it easier to follow. Uh, rule 11 talks about the manner of investment, uh, making direct investment by Indian entity, manner of making overseas portfolio investment by uh, Indian entity is talked in uh, rule 12, schedule two. Rule 13 talks about manner of making overseas investment by resident individual, Rule 14 talks about overseas investment by person resident in India other than Indian entity and resident individual. Rule 15 talks about investment in IFSC by person resident in India, that is Schedule 5. Rule 16 talks about the pricing guidelines. Now, uh, pricing guidelines for the first time talks about uh, the arm's length price. And it says that any investment the issue or transfer of equity capital of foreign e e entity from the person resident outside India or in India to person resident in India shall be subject to the price arrived on arms and basis by following any internationally accepted pricing methodology. So this is made in sync with NDI rules 2019 and also uh, how the prices uh, will be calculated, who can give the valuation report has and uh, has not been mentioned and has not been specified by RBI. It has been said to by RBI that the policy will be put in place by the AD banks for compliance of pricing guidelines and uh, the responsibility has been put on the AD banks that before facilitating any old overseas investment, it has to ensure the compliance with regard to the uh, provisions of pricing and they will frame their own policy. And in that policy, they can also specify the cases like uh, uh, where the pricing guidelines will not be insisted upon, like where the price is readily available, et cetera. Transfer or rule 17 talks about the transfer or liquidation. Uh, so we have already 
seen this that the earlier disinvestment was subjected to a prior approval of rbi in most of the cases now it has been put in the framework of uh, the pricing guidelines documentation and reporting requirements restructuring uh, restructuring uh, is permitted however it is subject to the amount of diminution in value which which is calculated with regard uh, to the accumulated losses of the uh, foreign entity restrictions and prohibitions uh, the earlier restrictions with regard to real estate activity gambling in any form and dealing in financial product link to the indian rupee without specific approval of rbi has been uh, restored and also the condition has been placed that any odi in startup shall be made only from the internal accruals of these startup entities we have seen this and restrictions with regard to acquisition or transfer of immovable uh, property outside india rule 21 talks about it and uh, then there are regulations that is uh, basically rule 1 and rule 2 uh, are uh, talks about defines the title and the date and uh, regulation pertaining to definition and then rule 3 4 5 6 talks about financial uh, rec- financial commitment if you see regulation 3 it is uh, it is financial commitment by indian entity by other modes other than equity capital equity capital is covered in the rules that uh, that is by way of odi in any other way the regulation 3 of foreign exchange management regulations 2022 overseas investment regulation 2022 will be managed and uh, con- regulated by that rule 4 talks about financial commitment by way of debt rule 5 talks about financial commitment by indian entity by way of guarantee rule 6 talks about financial commitment by way of pledge a uh, pertaining to our uh, definition so uh, mostly everything has been restored from the old regime however there are additional conditions uh, that has been put in place by the uh, regulations new oi regulations so uh, for the investment to be made in any debt instrument it needs that the indian entity is eligible to make overseas investment secondly it is that within the limit prescribed indian entity has already made the odi in foreign entity and the most important thing is that the indian entity has acquired controlled control in such foreign entity at the time of making such foreign commitment the investment in debt instrument should be backed by loan agreement and rate of interest should be at arms length so that we had already seen regulation 5 talks about the financial commitment by a way of uh, guarantee there are lot of uh, conditions that are there uh, with regard to financial commitment by way of uh, uh, guarantee and uh, the way finally fc limit shall be calculated is uh, also prescribed in the regulation regulation 6 talks about the pledging by the indian entity any pledging is allowed with regard to the assets in india assets outside india and uh, the provision related to financial cap- uh, commitment by way of pledge or charge uh, it can be in favor of the ad bank public financial institution and overseas lender debenture trustee and the facility which is available can be 
fund based non fund based and this is a uh, chart that talks about whether the amount shall be recurred towards financial commitment so in case there is a creation of charge if the indian entity is creating the charge on its assets in india in favor of ad bank whether uh, the uh, towards fund or non fund based facility then the value of charge or the amount of facility whichever is less will be calculated will be taken towards the calculation of financial commitment creation of charge on assets outside india the ad bank in, in to ad bank in india or public financial institution in india for the facility away on fund based non fund based facility again it will be recurred towards the uh, calculation of financial commitment and how it will be that the value of charge that has been created or the amount of facility whichever is less will be calculate uh, will be taken for the purpose of calculation of financial commitment so we'll quickly uh, see if there is anything which is uh, important yeah so let us see the obligation of person resident in india uh, they need to submit the evidence of acquisition of uh, the ownership or investment outside india within 6 months of uh, of remittance to the ad bank i said initially uh, 60 days it is 6 months uh, they need to submit the form fc and obtain uin number routed all the investment has to be routed through same uin all dues receivable or disinvestment proceeds has to be received in india within 90 days earlier it was 60 days now it has been made 90 days and uh, yeah and uh, the new form fc had been has been notified to report the investment by way of odi and uh, form fc any person is required to be filed by any person resident in india who has made odi and is making any financial commitment in foreign entity a person resident in india undertaking restructuring in foreign entity in section f he needs to file within uh, 30 days from the uh, from such date of restructuring the person resident in india undertaking this investment needs to file section g of form fc within 30 days from the date of receipt of disinvestment proceeds so form fc uh, is for investment in odi along with that the regular forms that is form apr and form fla the yearly forms are required to be uh, filed and uh, there is a rationalization with regard to form apr that now form apr is not required to be uh, filed in in the cases where the indian entity holds less than 10% of equity capital and has no control of foreign entity and there is no other financial commitment and the foreign or the foreign entity is under liquidation so in these two cases the aprs are not required to be a uh, filed and uh, reporting of opi is done in the manner that there is a form a form opi that has been introduced now a person who is resident in india other than resident individual making overseas portfolio investment needs to file the form opi uh, within 60 days from the end of half year in which such opi or transfer by way of sale is made as of september or march end in case the opi is made by way of acquisition of shares or interest under esop scheme in that case the indian entity shall be required to file a form opi within 60 days from the uh, half year ending in which such opi or transfer by way of sale is made as of september or march end so in case uh, the shares are acquired by way of esop 
the reporting shall be done by the office in india or branch of overseas entity or subsidiary in india of an overseas entity or the indian entity in which overseas entity has direct or indirect equity holding where resident individual is an employee or director there is a facility of lsf that has been given in the new rules uh, in the new regulations and also one of the thing that has been introduced for the first time is that if the person has delayed in reporting unless the delay in reporting is regularized he shall not be allowed to make any further financial commitment uh, towards such foreign equity uh, foreign entity or transfer such investment so compliance has been made mandatory with regard to uh, the uh, investment outside india and if the compliance with uh, uh, in the forms that has been specified form fc or form opi are not made or have not been made good in that case no further financial commitment will be allowed to be uh, made by such an indian uh, such an uh, indian entity so this was uh, with regard to uh, the o, uh, oi rules and oi uh, regulations what we have tried to see is major changes that has come and uh, the rule wise changes that has come and the regulation wise changes that has come uh, we have tried to touch on uh, that and there are still uh, many open issues that are there and we are expecting Uh, that the FAQ is issued by RBI uh, along with the central government on the on the open issues like uh, pricing guidelines or ODI FDI structure in in the in the uh, rules they have uh, uh, spoken about the valuation to be done by registered valuer. However, there is no no further. It has not been. Uh, there in the how it is to be done and further uh, notification on that is not there so whether it should be taken into consideration not to be taken into consideration and is to be uh, seen with later on as uh, the faqs come so uh, let me take the questions now in in case of loan to was rate of uh, interest shall be at arms length what is the procedure to allow, uh, to arrive at arms length rate and uh, should one refer to transfer pricing rules under income tax there is uh, it is not been uh, defined under the regulation as such the arms length is defined however the uh, the procedure in uh, by which the arms uh, the Uh, such arms length price is arrived at is not been defined so uh, it says that it can be arrived at by following any international uh, internationally accepted methodology however particularly to loan to was rate of interest it doesn't say that it just says that arms length price and uh, with regard to the internationally accepted pricing uh, methodology it says that in uh, pricing guidelines so if we are applying the one in transfer pricing rules under income tax maybe it is accepted uh, it should be till the time it is not further clarified we can take that it is accepted uh, by uh, the authorities but uh, when we talked about transfer pricing rules you know uh, there is it is very specific to the transactions uh, involving there are methods and uh, how much it can be justified and will we then justify the price by deleting one price and then coming at the appro most appropriate method so that is to be seen however till the time there is no such cl uh, clarification issue we can uh, understand that in this fashion only that it can be taken if apr mina is asking that if apr pending for yeah 
if uh, APR pending for other UINs, then can we allow further remittance? If you can see here, what we saw is that if the resident person has delayed in reporting, unless the delay in reporting is regularized, he or she shall not make any further commi uh, financial commitment, whether uh, directly towards such foreign entity or transfer such investment. So the, as a rule, as the regulation says, it is such foreign entity and such uh, transfer uh, such investment. So to my understanding, it should not restrict the uh, investments with regard to other UINs. So the question is that, uh, please tell what is the difference between overseas investment, ODI and financial commitment. So if I want to put it in a bucket, first of all, overseas, if I can use the pen and I can draw, Overseas investment shall be overseas. Okay, I can't do that. Uh, overseas investment is the biggest bucket. In that, there is an overseas portfolio investment and financial commitment. Now, in financial commitment, there are and um, there is uh, another uh, more components which includes ODI debt and fund, uh, non-fund-based facilities given by the Indian uh, entities. So overseas investment is the biggest, uh, biggest term. Then comes financial commitment, which includes debt as well. And then com uh, comes uh, overseas direct investment, which includes only the investment in equity capital. So I hope it, uh, I could clear it a bit. Will pricing guidelines okay? Will pricing guideline be applicable when shares are acquired by person resident uh, in India from another person resident in India who has renounced uh, its rights? See, with regard to the pricing guidelines, there is a lot of clarity that, that is required right now. There is, they have just said that uh, the AD Bank can make their own policy on the pricing guidelines. They have not specified who can do the valuation. And uh, they have said that it can be done by using internationally accepted pricing methodology. And it should be at arm's length price. So that is all that is being said. Now, in, in case of the transfer from or renunciation of rights from PR uh, person resident in India to person resident in, in, uh, in India or a person resident uh, to the person resident outside India, it, it is not clear right now. So we may expect that there is an FAQ that is issued by the authorities. Uh, please guide for capitalization of retained earning. Uh, what exactly is your question, Meena, with regard to the capitalization of retained earning? What we mean by capitalization of retained earning, if there are any exports that are done by the Indian entity, and uh, those exports, are the maybe the Indian entity is not able to realize, or for any other reason as well, uh, those export proceeds can be converted into the equity capital of the foreign entity. So that is meant, that is what is meant by capitalization of a retained earning. Now, what we discussed that this capitalization of retained earning is not included uh, for the purpose of calculation of limit of 400% of financial capital. In case of, uh, yeah, we have already taken this question. So, okay, uh, there is a question by Swati. Please describe non-fund based commitment. So, uh, Swati, as we had seen, uh, we had touched on it that no, as such, uh, the non-fund based facilities or non-fund based financial commitment 
has not been defined just uh, uh, so uh, it is in the regulation regulation 3 4 a uh, five six basically talks about the uh, financial commitment now out of this if you see the four, the fin the regulation 3 talks about financial commitment by more other than equity capital which is applicable to all the uh, four five six uh, financial commitment by way of regulation 4 financial commitment by regulation 5 and 6 now financial commitment if it is made by way of guarantee or if it is made by way of pledging of the assets of indian entity in that case it will be it is that is what is non fund based financial commitment so fund based is is your debt and non fund based financial commitment where there is no upfront flow of fund however there may be the future liability like in case of corporate guarantee in case of performance guarantee in case of uh, performance guarantee is to be taken at 50% now in case of pledging of shares so there may be a future uh, it is non fund based commitment that is uh, that is there i i hope uh, i was able to clear your doubt okay so uh, yeah it's a uh, it's a comment or uh, i'll just uh, so it says that there is a liberalization in transfer of shares by way of gift restriction of gift uh, of shares so mr sudhakar rao desai is the one who is making this statement let me just read it out it looks like a statement a restrictions of gift of shares by resident to non resident and vice versa that resident individuals are not permitted to transfer any overseas investment by way of gift to uh, to a person resident outside india that's right further a resident individual may acquire foreign securities by way of gift from person resident outside india in accordance with the provisions of fcr so that's right should an indian entity renounces suppose an indian entity renounces the shares in favor of another indian entity uh, should the new indian entity submit uh, form fc yes yes i uh, there is no reason why the new form fc will not be submitted okay are there more questions uh, what's the question is loan from other than banks acceptable so is loan from other than bank acceptable like uh, am i missing on something or the question is not complete what do we want to say as far as the uh, debt uh, Uh, investment in debt instrument or giving debt to the foreign entity there are conditions that needs to be satisfied by the indian entity giving debt to the foreign entity by indian entity there are like there has to be uh, agreement the uh, rate of interest has to be at arms length there has to be control in that entity so all those conditions needs to be satisfied are there more questions because uh because you know what we are seeing that there are uh, still open issues and we are also in the process of interpreting the uh, rules and regulations and uh, it looks like that it is bit scattered all over rules and uh, directions regulations and directions so directions uh, such there are so many things which are uh, there in the directions and not there in rules they are not clarificatory in nature they are the new conditions that have been specified through uh, the direction so those all needs to be uh, right now clarified uh, with the faqs
can a foreign entity have more than one uin allotted by rbi in case investment made by indian entities who are not related so if in case of foreign entity uh, it will be uh, in case of one foreign entity it will be one uin that will be allotted by rbi Okay, there are more questions. I'm just seeing it. Yes, the PPT will be shared. Okay. Is ODI is ODI allowed for resident individuals? Yes, ODI is allowed for resident individuals, and. Uh, resident individuals are can invest in an unlisted entity and uh, uh, in a case of uh, listed entity in case of opi the investment is as specified uh, there are um, there are restrictions on the way investment can be uh, done by the resident individuals so first of all there is a limit uh, to which the resident individuals can invest uh, that is the limit of lrs and uh, beyond that the person cannot make investment any other questions that you may have you may uh, we can take it up any more questions uh, that you may have otherwise arachit we can close the session oh yes ma'am i think uh, we have answered most of the questions so uh, i can end the session now so i on behalf of thank or uh, taxman thank you for taking your time out and being here today uh, thanks for sharing your profound knowledge and practical experience the session was wonderful thank you all participants for uh, joining us and making this webinar interactive and successful the link for ppt and recorded version of the webinar will be made to you uh, thank you very much thank you